Berlin, December 28, 1746. The newspapers, the banners, and the choirs of children all have a new name for their monarch, Frederick the Great. And the reasons are obvious to everyone who greets him as he returns victorious from the Second Silesian War. Not only had the Prussian army won every battle, Frederick had personally led his forces. At the Battle of Soar, Charles of Lorraine had ambushed Frederick's camp, the Austrians outnumbering his army nearly two to one, but Frederick fought his way free. Then, when Prussia was under its greatest threat, when Austria and Saxony planned a two-pronged invasion to take Berlin, Frederick and his general had defeated both forces, taking Saxony's great city of Dresden and negotiating an end to the war. That's why the newspapers call him the Great. That and the fact that he'd probably written ahead to inform them all of his new title. But if you've been watching this show for any extended period of time, you're probably going to be familiar with the next precedent. A great monarch cannot know peace for long. Do you want to see the next episode of this series immediately after watching this one instead of having to wait a full week? Well, now with the new Nebula first, you totally can. Learn how after the episode. Victory in the First and Second Silesian Wars secured Prussia's reputation as a rising power and Frederick as a man to be reckoned with. It also bought him a decade of peace and splendor that could be attributed to not only his battlefield skill, but also two of his tenants when it came to warfare. The first was that Frederick believed over all else in the power of military speed. He who got his army out and able to act first won, and the best way to lose a conflict was to draw it out. He knew the Prussian army couldn't remain effective indefinitely, so his wars needed a quick conclusion. And the second reason was that while Frederick was good at war, he didn't like it. Even his mentor, Eugene of Savoy, had commented on this when Frederick was a young officer, and he meant it as a compliment. Frederick wasn't bloodthirsty. Frankly, he'd rather be at the new summer home he'd built in Potsdam, which he'd given the French name of Sans Souci, or without worries. There, in an environment of his own design, he was free to write poetry, play the flute, display his porcelain collection, dote over his beloved greyhounds, and gather about him an inner circle of philosophers and military officers, all of them male, as women were banned. Oh, yeah, just a quick FYI here, Frederick was also a huge misogynist, which at least partway explains his antagonism towards both Maria Theresa and Empress Elizabeth of Russia. Also, if a guy in his inner circle ever got married, he often kicked them out. Said circle he developed included some of the most prominent minds in Europe, including his old editor Voltaire, who came to live in Prussia after stirring the pot a little too much in France. He also provided safe harbor to Julien Offre de la Métrie, a scandalous philosopher whose work argued that humans were just organic machines, no better than animals, and that the mind and soul were part of the body rather than a spiritual entity. In fact, he literally argued that humans were nothing more than a digestive system. Hot stuff at the time, especially since he denied the existence of God and advocated the pursuit of pleasure. And you bet these ideas jived with Frederick, who was privately an outspoken atheist. In fact, he found pretending to be religious one of the hardest parts of the masquerade he'd had to perform for his father. He once wrote that Christianity was a fiction, invented in the fevered minds of Asia, with its followers in Europe either being fanatics, imbeciles, or those pretending belief in order to gain power. He also jokingly suggested Jesus and the Apostle John were gay lovers. So suffice to say, at the time, Frederick was unconventional in his views. But that also led to tolerant religious policies that saw all Protestant groups given equality and Catholics allowed to practice, though not allowed in civil service. However, he was also extremely anti-Semitic. Jews could live in Prussia, but had to pay a tax for security. Which, honestly, is just like Frederick. Seriously, for everything you learn about him that you like, he'll tend to have an equally awful quality. And that's definitely a pattern that's going to come up again and again. So watch out for that. This decade also provided his first really prolific period of writing. Partly, these histories were meant to burnish his reputation and iron out less complimentary episodes in his career. He exaggerated enemy numbers at Malwitz, for instance, claiming that the Austrians had a much larger force than they did, and casting his flight from the battlefield as a reluctant but daring escape. In addition, he wrote his first book on military theory, primarily to distribute to his generals. He also drilled his troops, because Frederick wanted to be ready for the next war. He innovated, adopting a new system of formation marching that ensured troops could quickly reposition, change direction, and adopt new formations on the battlefield. He figured out ways to go over broken ground or ditches while maintaining order, and adopted snare drums as a way of conveying orders, since they were easier to hear amidst battle than a human voice. 
He also promoted his younger brothers. Wait, did we not mention he had brothers? Well, he did, and they served as officers in the Silesian Wars, but now were made generals. Of the two, his youngest brother, Prince Henry, would become the most dependable. Henry had many things in common with Frederick, like his head for tactics and a tendency towards affairs with fellow officers. But he was also notably more measured. And Frederick would need dependable generals, because by 1756, Europe was about to see its First World War. Now, it would be far too much to describe in this series how the Seven Years' War started, since the motivations are enormously complicated. Like the War of Austrian Succession, it was an umbrella conflict that encompassed a lot of little wars. But in Central Europe, it was all about Silesia again. See, when Frederick took Silesia, the Protestant state of Brandenburg, Prussia, essentially announced itself as a challenger to Catholic Austria, which had held sway over the Holy Roman Empire for centuries. Worse, it gave Prussia a border right on Bohemia, meaning Prussia could invade Austrian lands at will. Austria needed Silesia back, and Prussia crushed. So, through a series of both public and secret diplomatic agreements, Maria Theresa had entered defensive alliances with both Russia and Saxony to support each other in case of Prussian aggression, then decimate Brandenburg Prussia and partition it amongst themselves. Frederick, for his part, had his eye on Saxony and Polish West Prussia, the conquest of which could link up his broken territories. But for all of his supposed genius, he badly bungled his diplomacy. What protected him from the Austro-Russian alliance was the support of France. But he also pursued and signed an alliance with its rival, Britain, promising not to attack the British royal family's German possessions of Hanover in exchange for Britain funding Frederick in case of war. But that agreement blew up the balance of diplomacy in Europe, so much so that it's now known as the Diplomatic Revolution of 1756. France became furious with Frederick for allying with its enemy Britain, leaving France isolated without any allies in Europe. And this wasn't the first time he'd screwed them over diplomatically either. There had been that secret truce with Austria during the First Silesian War, then making a separate peace with Austria and dropping out of the Second Silesian War. So, yeah, you could hardly blame France when they dropped Frederick as an ally and aligned with Austria. And the Russians, furious with the British having simultaneously negotiated a peace with them and their enemy Prussia, also pledged troops to Austria. This was a massive realignment of powers, and everyone started preparing for war. Frederick, seeing this, true to form, decided to strike first. And on August 26, 1756, he led his troops into Saxony. But this would not be Silesia all over again. Frederick blundered his way into an ambush in the fog, his troops raked by fire of hidden artillery and infantry. In a confused engagement, his cavalry charged twice without orders, and he accidentally fired on his own troops. While able to later spin it as a victory, the Austrians left the battlefield since they only wanted to halt Frederick. It was in reality a narrow defeat. These are not the same Austrians, his officers muttered. Turns out, the enemy had been training too though he managed to capture Saxony, as was his plan, and impress their military into his own, but he did have to wait until winter ended to attack Prague, hoping to capture it and then march on Vienna. But then the Austrians met him at Prague. He attacked their positions across what appeared to be grassy hills, but that were, in reality, fish ponds. They took the heights, but at a cost. In five hours, Frederick lost 14,000 men and two of his best generals, including the one that had saved him at Mulwitz. Depleted, he decided to take Prague by starving them out in a siege rather than by assault. But that was when the Austrian relief army of 54,000 came for him, and he was made to split his forces, leaving a detachment at the siege and facing the oncoming army with only 34,000 men. Soon, it would be Prussia against the world. And actually, that could be sooner than you think, because you can watch our fifth and final episode of our Frederick the Great series a whole week early and ad-free right now over on Nebula, our creator-owned and operated streaming service that I am super excited to tell you just got even better. As I'm sure you know by now, because frankly, I never shut up about it. Over on Nebula, you can see all of our shows like Extra Credits and the returning Extra Mythology at least 24 hours early and without ads like this one. Hi. But now, we and a bunch of our creator friends are ramping up a brand new feature we're calling Nebula First. Basically, it works like this. Thanks to everyone's support who subscribed to Nebula, we can now produce and release every episode of Extra History a full week before they're posted to YouTube, meaning you get even more of our historical tales faster than ever before. And in the case of our next Frederick the Great episode, you're gonna get to see early, a framing device that I am just super excited about that we're gonna use to cover a few of the wars. Let's get ready to rumble! 
Frederick has smashed into the French army double his size. But wait, oh. here comes Empress Catherine with a folding chair. Peter III is deposed. What a slobber knocker. Man, I wish they used professional wrestling to teach history when I was in school, but I digress. That is also not the only early awesomeness you're going to see over on Nebula. You'll get access to tons of other great Nebula First content from creators like Isaac Arthur, Mariana's Corner, and Nando V Movies, all posting at least a week before you'd see their videos over on YouTube. And that's on top of all of the exclusive shows we've done over there, the classes Jeff and I made on how to land your dream job, and 10 things to decide before creating a video game, I'll let you decide whose of those is whose, and other truly epic Nebula originals like real-life lore series Modern Conflicts that I cannot stop myself from watching every time a new episode drops. Seriously, it's becoming a bit of a problem, and thank you for it. Now, Nebula is normally priced at a pretty dang reasonable 50 bucks a year. But if you use our link in the description, you'll get $10 off that annual subscription, which then breaks your monthly cost down to something like $3.33, repeating if you're into that sort of thing, which is just truly a phenomenal deal for all of the content you get over on Nebula. And actually, I'm just going to break script for a second real quick and mention one more thing that is more of a personal element, I guess, to all of this. When you support us over on Nebula, you're not only helping to support EC and, quite frankly, the best group of educational creators I've ever found on the internet, make the content that we love, but you're also helping all of us not be entirely dependent on YouTube for our livelihoods. And I gotta say, just speaking as someone who makes content in this space, that's a really nice feeling. So thank you everybody who's already subbed. And if you're thinking about it, it's a great way to support us and all of those other creators. So with all that said, let me be the first to welcome you to the Nebula First experience, because I really think you're going to enjoy it. Hope to see you over there, everyone. Thanks so much. What if I told you that Ahmed Ziad Turk, Angela Valenciana, Arcolite Games, Casey Mustia, Dominic Valenciana, Joseph Blame, Kuya Koi, and Skylar Holmes were all legendary patrons? I'm not kidding. 